blowing in the waves and the wind and everything is bad, raining and lightning, hurt, just hurricane force deal, okay? Well, they got scared, okay? And he was back in the back of the boat asleep. So they woke him up, and he told them, all oh, you of little faith, okay? And look, he rebuked the wind, the waves, and all of it, and there was a, the Bible says, and there was a great calm on the sea. Okay, and all his disciples were looking and was talking about, what kind of man is this that the winds and the waves of the sea obey him? Okay, well, I, I'll tell you why they obeyed him. They knew him as the creator. So, hey, the created obeys the creator. Okay, very simple. Okay. Now, I'm the kind be uh, with Uncle Cy this Tuesday night for the, the Bible study because again, Wednesday because of Thanksgiving and I'll just give you a heads up. Uncle Cy in that video says okay about a thousand times. Okay? So prepare yourself for that. Okay? Okay. Be good, okay? So anyway, Tuesday night, be here for Uncle Cy. Let's go ahead and pray and we'll talk about real obedience. Gracious Father, you are, uh, again, awesome. And uh, you have created everything that we see, everything that we know, anything that we can fathom and, and think of, Father. Uh, you have set the earth in motion. You've spun the sun. Uh, everything, God, you are so awesome. And we ask now that you'll help us to understand what's so important about obedience. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. So there was a bird that lived in Canada. And this bird decided... <laughs> it's supposed to do that, no worries. This bird decided he did not want to fly south for the winter. In fact, he told the other birds, you're crazy for even thinking about going south for the winter because you're going to fly all the way down there and you're going to have to turn around and come right back. What's the point, he said. And so the other birds took flight and left him behind. This little Canadian goose. He wondered what uh, the winters in Canada would be like. And once the Indian summer arrived, he was pleasantly surprised. Aha, he said to himself, I was right. This is wonderful. But then winter hit full force in December. Shuddering in the cold, the silly bird then realized, I must hurry and leave before I freeze to death. So he took flight, and he made it as far as Montana, where in mid-flight, he froze. His wings froze, and he fell to the ground, and he landed on a farm, right in the barnyard. And he said, oh, what a stupid bird I am. I should have flown south with all the other birds, but now I am about to die. Just then, a cow walked by, and he took a little cow pop right on top of him. <laughs> There's a big pile of cow pop for the size of the goose that he is. <laughs> and he mumbled to himself, oh, this is just great. It's not bad enough that I'm about to die. Now I'm covered with cow manure. But then he noticed something he didn't expect. The warmth of the plop actually began to thaw him out and restore him to life. Why, what do you know about that, said the bird. This ain't so bad after all. So then he began chirping and singing under the pile of cow plop. <laughs> Meanwhile, the barnyard cat was passing by. This is a big barnyard cat. <laughs> and he heard the sound of singing coming from the pile. And curious as a cat can be, he pawed around in the pile and uncovered the thawed out bird. Their eyes met, and there was a silent moment of suspense, and then the cat ate the bird. The moral of the story is fourfold. First, not everyone who dumps on you is your enemy. <laughs> Second, not everyone who cleans it off is your friend. Third, when you get 
stepped on, it's best to keep your mouth shut. <laughs> and fourth, fly south for the winter. <laughs> In other words, do that which God has created you to do. Fulfill His purposes in your life. Obedience to what obedience to what God has called you to do can keep you out from under the pile. You see, real obedience involves action. And to demonstrate what obedience looks like, I'm going to ask Chris to come up here. Just like that is how obedience works. You say something, and, and they come. So, no, I'm going to just I'm going to give it over to Chris. Chris is going to demonstrate something. He's also going to introduce you to our special guest. Who said, 
no, I won't, but then he did? Or do you identify yourself with the son who said, yes, I will, but no, I won't? You see, it's interesting. That second son, he gives the perfect answer. Yes, I will, sir. Uh, what parent doesn't want a child that says, sir, and responds like that all of the time? Sir, ma'am, how great that would be. But it was just lip service. So in other words, are you walking the walk? Or are you just giving lip service? Are you just talking the talk? Do you say yes, Lord, with your mouth? And no, Lord, with your actions? You see, Jesus is calling you to wake up this morning if you identify yourself with the second son who is disobedient to God. Jesus is calling you to real action. So let's look at the question. Which of the two did what his father asked? The first, they answered. And again, this was a tough question. Jesus is essentially asking the listeners to choose between two, uh, the lesser of two evils. All right, guys, pick the son who was blatantly and obviously disobedient, or pick the son who was deceptive. And they choose the correct answer, the first. And so at this point, Jesus has set the hook. See, Jesus was a fisherman. Before he asked this question, he had thrown the line out. And he was trying to get the Pharisees to bite, just as any fisherman tries to get the fish to bite. So Jesus has got his line cast, and he's slowly pulling it in, making the worm wiggle. And then the Pharisees, they answer what they think is just an innocent question. And at that point, Jesus sets the hook. He's got their attention, and he quickly reels them in in order to fillet them. Because Jesus says to them, I tell you the truth. The tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. So what did Jesus intend for the Pharisees to understand? What was his point in saying this? Well, as you can tell, Jesus didn't hold back. He didn't mince words. He was trying to get them to understand that they were not obeying God. This is kind of like the joke, what does the hand say to the face? Slap. <laughs> That's what this experience should have been with the Pharisees. It should have been a wake-up call. But instead, they got mad. You see, Jesus is challenging the religious leaders to acknowledge their disobedience. He's not simply saying, hey, prostitutes and tax collectors, they're better than you are. No, Jesus is saying that you're not obeying God because you've rejected John's teaching. John the Baptist taught about Jesus, the way of righteousness. John's message was repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Repent because the Son of Man, the Messiah, the Christ, the chosen one is right behind me. And the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they didn't all accept that message. They rejected it. They scoffed at John. They said, ah, we have Moses. We know the truth. But you see, if they would have really known the truth, and they would have seen the truth in John's message, they would have seen the truth in Jesus' message. Jesus was the point to John's message. So if they rejected John and his message, they're going to reject Jesus and his message. And that's exactly what they did. But not everyone rejected John's message. You see, the people who had been forgotten about by the Pharisees, who had been cast aside, the sinners, captured here by tax collectors and prostitutes who would, would have been viewed as some of the lowest of sinners, they accepted the hope that was in John's message, the hope of redemption, the hope of forgiveness, the hope of a new life. That's exactly what Jesus offered them. And you know what? 
these Pharisees, these religious leaders, knew exactly, that, they, they knew that Jesus was talking about them. In verse 21, 45 through 46, Jesus, or, uh, Jesus says, or it's written, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. So again, they didn't want to arrest him because Jesus said, hey, those sinners are better than you are. No, no, they wanted to arrest Jesus because he said that they were disobedient to God. The whole point of their lives, they felt, was being obedient to God. But they were way off base. They were the son who says, I will, sir, but really weren't being obedient. Ultimately, they wanted to kill Jesus. They wanted to permanently shut him up. As Jesus said that darkness hates the light. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not understood it. The Pharisees, the religious leaders, don't understand what Jesus is talking about. They don't understand that he is the way, the truth, and the life. They don't understand that he came for them. So instead of waking up and confessing Jesus' identity, they just run to the darkness. They sought to arrest him. They sought to kill him. Now, depending on which son you identify with determines what Jesus wants you to understand. And I know for a fact that some of you are sitting here and you are saying to yourselves, well, William, really, I can't identify with either of those sons. And you're right, because you're not a male, you're a female. So just pretend that it's a daughter who is obedient or disobedient. Who do you identify with? If you identify with the first son who was obedient, Jesus wants you to understand you're doing exactly what you're supposed to. Despite starting this life out as a sinner, as a rebel, you've been redeemed. And so you'll end this life as a redeemed saint. But if you identify with the second son, the one who gave lip service, who was disobedient, Jesus wants you to understand his death was for a very specific reason. It wasn't so that you could live in your sins and go to heaven. You see, real obedience to God requires action. It requires real action. And the real action is what Christians do. Now before you can obey, you have to know what to do. You have to pick up the phone. You have to talk to God. You have to listen specifically to what God is saying. So many people in today's world, maybe even in today's church, they say, God doesn't talk to me. But the truth is, He is talking to you. You just aren't listening. There's a story about Franklin Roosevelt, and I, I doubt the truthfulness of this story because it's just absolutely absurd, but it's, it illustrates a very good point. Mr. Roosevelt, whenever he was president, was standing in a receiving line, greeting guests as they came in. And he was pretty confident that nobody was listening to him, and so he thought that he would play a little game. As people came through the line, he would smile, shake their hand, and say in a very calm voice, I murdered my grandmother this morning. <laughs> People would go through just as he expected. Oh, how lovely. Well, keep up the good work. Great job. But finally, there was one foreign diplomat. Whenever <coughs> President Roosevelt smiled at him and said, I murdered my grandmother this morning, the diplomat responded back by saying, I'm sure she deserved it. <laughs> Again, I'm sure that's not true, but it serves to, to illustrate that, you know, sometimes we're not listening. God is telling us something, and we just smile and we say, yeah, that's great. You see, God doesn't speak in an audible voice anymore as it appears he did throughout the Old Testament. I'm not saying that he can't, I'm not saying that he won't, but generally, it doesn't happen. There's a very, very good chance that Christians are going to go their entire lives without walking along and seeing a burning bush. 
Because God has a better way of speaking to us now. He speaks to us through the Holy Spirit. By the blood of Christ, we have a better relationship with God than those in the Old Testament. So God uses other means of communication. And in order to hear God, you have to understand what kind of listener are you. There are three types of listeners. The first listener is a passive listener. These people tune God out and they don't listen to Him. They do not hear from God. It's sort of like a radio station. You complain, well, there's no music coming in through the radio. Well, that's because you have to turn it on and tune in to the right frequency. Otherwise, you're not going to hear any radio. So there are passive listeners. There are also selective listeners. They hear what they want to hear. And they aren't going to hear what they need to hear. Passive listeners only hear what they want. The third type of listener, aggressive listeners. They not only hear, but they also seek to obey. They put into action what God has told them to do. Whether, whatever it is. And now there are three ways that you can hear from God. The first way that you hear from God is through prayer. And it takes discernment to understand who's talking. You know, because usually whenever you pray, there are a couple solutions for where the voice is coming from. Number one, it's coming from God. Number two, it's coming from you. Number three, it's coming from Satan. And number four, it's coming from the pizza that you ate last night. <laughs> it takes discernment to understand and, and to figure out the real voice of God. And sometimes that means going to an older, mature Christian and asking them to help you. The second way that you hear from God is through Scripture. Let's say you've got a problem. And so you open up the Bible and you start reading it and you start trying to figure out uh, what does God say about your problem. And then all of a sudden, in plain language, it's like someone turned on a light switch. There it is, the solution to your problem. God speaks to you through Scripture. The third way that God can speak to you is through other believers, other Christians. You know, there are times whenever you'll be praying about something. You'll be reading scripture, trying to figure out what in the world am I supposed to do, God? And nothing. But then you go to someone who is mature in their faith.